for a fun day. Come on, Connor. Come on, Cooper. Edmonton Public Schools offers programs for young learners. At Beacon Heights, we have an early education program and we serve a larger catchment area of Northeast Edmonton. There are many children who come to us either with severe special needs that are identified, some with mild, moderate special needs, and we always have some spaces for the children who live here in the community close to our school. Play is what children are all about. So whether they have any identified special needs or not, or they're typically developing children, play is the avenue that we use to help them with their growth and development. Okay, put it your hand in. Don't eat me! Don't eat you? I think when you um, are in the classroom and you see them as a child first, then automatically you do what a child needs first. And yes, we have children with autism that we need to address what their needs are and children with speech delays and a wide variety of delays and disabilities. But I think having everything sort of planned as a child first, everything else just falls into place. So I don't know that we need to be an expert on every delay or every disability, but what we need to do is just remember that they're children and if we need to make an accommodation for a child that doesn't want to sit at circle then we'll bring in a little table and chair set so that they can sit on the periphery of circle and they're still getting the benefit of being with us but we don't push them into the circle if that's not where their comfort level is. I think it's just really important having kids want to be here and want to participate and not because they have to and I think setting an environment up where kids will take the risk, they feel safe, they know they're cared for, they want to be part of the group, they don't want to be out of it, they want to be there. Sarah was diagnosed with 5P syndrome which is a very rare genetic disorder. She was diagnosed at the age of two. I can honestly say that there's not been one day where she has said, I don't want to go to school. So as a parent, that's really reassuring is that she's really enjoying herself here. She's learning, but she's having fun. And I think that's so important for my, for my little girl. They work with Sarah's needs. So if Sarah needs to step away, go for a little walk, you know, she's sitting at circle time, but you know, she needs that little, little walk around the building. They do that with her and it just works. In our classroom, I think the philosophy that we have is that our, our kids are co-constructors of their learning. Um, as a teacher, I know that it's my responsibility to follow along with the guidelines of the kindergarten statement, but I think along with that, we know kids can take responsibility for their own learning. Children are competent and they can make some really nice choices about their own learning, but at the same time, having in my head um, some planning and some ideas of where I want children to go and then really picking up on it. If they're playing at the block center, what are they saying around the block center too? And then being able to take some of their comments and push it forward into some really nice learning experiences that really they've come up with the idea on their own and it's my job is to make sure that we get some of the nice foundational learning around it. Look Connor, we were talking about zebras at circle today. Z for zebra. Kids are um, engaged with activities and they're doing it independently. So they're choosing where they want to go, what they want to do, and they're interacting with it independently. And at the same time, they're playing and they're having fun, but knowing that through their play, it's a time for them to practice some of the learning that they've been doing. Everything that's out in the classroom, everything we do, every activity we plan, every song we sing, every message that's written on the board, all has a purpose. Can you show us our pattern, Keenan? Leaf, bud, leaf, bud, leaf, bud. The purpose leaf. might be to build vocabulary for children that have a speech delay. We the activity will. might have a purpose for children that are presenting here with a severe behavior disorder, can feel some success participating in a circle activity for children that have physical gross motor delays or fine motor delays. We have purpose for some of the little fine motor activities that we have out. And I think that any activity that is thoughtfully prepared and thoughtfully planned 
and it has a purpose to it, then it's a best practice, not just for a child that has a delay in an area, but for all children. Which two go together? The bird and the eggs in the nest. How come bird and eggs in a nest go together? The association with brain development and play is that Play puts children in that state of learning and of being where they're calm, they're confident, they're able to take risks, it's pleasurable. Look at Satoshi doing some balancing on one leg and one arm. And when you're in that play state of mind, then anything is possible. And it lets them use those executive functions in their brain. And that's what we want for children because that's where they'll learn. When children are playing, they gather all of the skills that they need for the next step in their development. So most importantly, they have language skills that they are using. They are using fine motor skills in their play. They are using their gross motor skills. They are especially using social skills as they get older in their play. And so we think, oh, they're just playing. But in fact, that's when most of the learning is happening for them. And that's when we have to be ready to maybe step in, maybe present something another time. I have two EAs in the classroom, and then we have an extended team. So I have Kate and Nicole, who are my speech language pathologists. And Cindy is an occupational therapist who's part-time on staff. Carla is a physical therapist, part-time on staff. And for three hours, we try our best to be the highlight of their day. Shake it, shake it. Oh, good shaking. Yeah! We do have a fairly large team here and part of our philosophy in this program is that we try to be as interdisciplinary as we can. So we try to make sure that when somebody who's new to the classroom walks in, they don't necessarily know who the teacher is, who the speech therapist is, who the EAs are. Everybody is just doing really good work with the children. So that's where those monthly planning meetings are really important. So we come together as a group once a month and we discuss all of the goals and targets and we discuss individual children as well to see if we need some extra strategies for a particular child or if we need to discuss how something is working with them and how everybody can be supporting those learning plans. And then when we're in the classroom, it's just sort of one fluid team. Everybody knows what each child needs. Everybody knows what all the targets and the focus is. Our big focus in the program is for role release. So I don't particularly think of my job as only my job, it's everybody's job. And the same for everyone else. So I teach everybody else how to do my job so that when I'm not there, it still gets done so that everybody's a teacher, everybody's a speech therapist, everybody's an occupational therapist by the end of things. Connor, my goodness, it's so exciting, all of these letters. You could say, Sheila, look, another P. For the month of May, for example, I might choose a sound target and a concept that I want the children to learn, a language goal like answering why questions or how questions. So we sit down and I say, these are my targets. How are we going to work these into the classroom? And as a team, we come up with tons of ideas for how we're going to incorporate and embed all of those little speech and language targets into everything that we do throughout the day. This flower pot says J A. A. Probably at circle time you'll see some activities that may not look speech and language but they have a, a speech and language base in them. So we try to do things like incorporating concepts like many and few when we're doing the calendar and counting numbers. Sometimes we'll incorporate rhyming or alliteration into our circle so we might dismiss the kids to gym by saying if your name starts with a k sound you can line up the door. Keenan starts with a k sound. K. 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 For Cooper, K. for Connor. Connor. I think I had an ideal childhood, knowing what I know now about young children. I grew up in a small town. We had lots and lots of opportunity for free play. For a lot of children, it isn't possible to have as much free exploration, in the city especially. If you're living in an apartment building or you're living in a closed quarter somewhere, I think it's very hard for parents to let their children have lots of exploration on their own. Many of our children come to us without having many 
really meaningful play experiences with others. So not every child entering kindergarten is coming to us ready for very cooperative, engaging, language-rich play. They aren't there yet, so we have to facilitate and make sure that they have those experiences that get them to that spot. You have to ask Michael. Hey, that was nice. What do you say to Michael? Thank you for the ball. So often we think of at-risk students. Well, we can be at risk by having a play deficit. If you haven't had all those rich opportunities to play, and especially with other children, then when you come into a larger classroom and there's 20 children, that can be very, very frightening for some children. They don't know where to begin. I got two. I got one from Chad. <laughs> So many people have lost that playfulness or that ability to play and that it's something that you need to really nourish your whole life long. And some parents do not know how to play. Step, point, throw! Josh on day! This afternoon we are having a family-oriented programming session here at the school. We often go into their homes or into the community. We look at what the children's needs are and we try to facilitate some work with the family so that they are understanding the strategies and the goals for their children. How can they attain those goals in a fun way? There you go, now swing up onto this one. There we go, yay! So today they're here at the school and we are having a session on gross motor skills. We want parents to get to the parks, use the playgrounds, use all the facilities that they have, the backyard. So having you come today, although I'm hoping it looked like we were just having fun and playing, Really what we were doing was putting your kids through the rigors of some really good learning activities, working on fine motor, working on our gross motor, working on being creative, working on those school readiness skills, but also things that you can talk to your kids about or work with your kids so that you're working on things like building vocabulary, building concept development, like going up the ladder so you can go down the slide, going fast, going slow, hanging upside down practicing those action words like running and jumping and talking about kids so that not only are you talking about the word but the kids are actually experiencing it too. Another thing that we do with families is help them to accept and know their children. We often ask when they're first arriving, tell me something about your child that you're most proud of. What can they do? What are they interested in? What possibilities do you see for your children in the future? Tell us your story. And that might be the very first time that anyone has ever asked that parent to really look at their child and go, wow, there is lots of possibilities here. Or I never realized how many wonderful things there are about my child. I was so focused on what they couldn't do that I wasn't paying attention to what they could do. Yes! And that's what we do here is try to pay attention to what the child can do and work from those strengths. I think right now we're just working on the social interaction with the other kids. Um, so today was very helpful just to see how she would respond with the other kids today and she did, she did very well. You know, she's made progress, she's walking, she's running, climbing, she's doing all the things that we weren't sure she'd do. So we're happy about that. Yeah. When these families are coming in with two and a half and three year olds and have just come from being told that their child is quite severely delayed. Um, it's devastating for the parents and it's our job to try to show them that just because this is where they're at now doesn't mean that that's where they're going to be at years from now. Parents don't know what that next spot always is and that's why we really work hard and close with our parents to help show them and teach them and be with them to know what should I be expecting. So what is an expectation for a four or a five-year-old? Just knowing what they are capable of doing, that's a big thing for parents to understand. I learned that she, she can do more than we think she can do. 
Like often if she'll drop something, especially with her vision, um, I expect I should go and help her with it. But if you let her do it herself, she's so much better off and she'll, you know, grow from that. And today when we were throwing the balls and stuff too, I noticed Summer was able to just go off on her own and she's quite happy just playing with other people and other parents. That's one of our guiding principles, is that families are partners in education and that we have to help families understand that they are in this. They are part of the school experience and that they will be with their children through all of their years of school and their whole life in their lifelong learning. And it isn't somebody else's job, it's a partnership. So it's that sort of triad where we have the family, the child and the teacher and that as a teacher and as a team we are stepping in for just three hours a day. We have a little communication book that we would write in every day too and parents are asked to write back so we get a nice little dialogue about what's happening at home and they know what's happening at school and then we do a monthly family oriented programming session and that often is in the home where we bring some of the learning activities and we have many that happen in the school and also many that happen in the community so we've had family oriented programming sessions at the local library Authentic assessment is really seeing what the child is capable of doing in their world of play. And we can do that in lots of ways. We use video recordings a lot. We use pictures because a picture can say a thousand words. We see what the children can do throughout the normal routines and tasks of a day. If we try to test a little child, hmm, can you zip your coat? Well, what's the importance of that? We want to make sure that they can do a task that is important to them to help make them self-sufficient and independent. Bye. Authentic assessment can be their ability to use language appropriately. So maybe sitting with a teacher one-on-one -on -one and being able to imitate sounds is one thing. But when I'm jostling for position to get a ball that's getting thrown out in the gym class and I need to use my words, that is a more important time almost to show that you can speak and get your needs met. How many socks did you carry? Wait, you forgot. Giving kids permission to advocate for themselves is important and I think that's learned through play too, like negotiating. And so during play and even during those little altercations that happen when kids play together, we really allow our kids to try to work through what the differences are as opposed to a grown up stepping in and trying to solve their problems for them sharing it doesn't come naturally I mean I think that's something that's learned do we have to sit down and teach it to you no we set out some activities where there's two glue sticks and four kids so automatically you're going to have to learn how to do some sharing and some turn taking because we can't all use the glue stick at the same time and I think the same goes with playtime too <gasps> oh there's been a derailment we understand the development of play where we have parallel play and we're just happy if kids are sitting on a mat together playing even if it's independent because we know that the next step will be where they start sort of that little crossover where they start playing together and they start sharing and they start using some words to interact with each other and then before you know it they're sitting at a table and they're playing a turn-taking game and they've got the vocabulary. Your turn. You have a mat? Yeah. Turn them over. Turn them over. Let's see. All right. Put them on your pile. When we move out of school and into universities or into careers or jobs, there's very few places that you will ever work where you're just all by yourself and you're isolated. And I think having those playful experiences all the way through school allow you to practice your social interaction skills, your communication skills, allow you to practice getting along with people, the opportunity to learn how other people think and how you interact with them. And I think just allowing those experiences throughout school, starting with little playtime activities over a sandbox when you're five, really sets us up for success in the future. That's a bird feather. Me. I volunteer a lot so I get to see them work with her and stuff and her confidence levels have been through the roof and most people can't even tell she's legally blind. Bye.
summer. I need to check it out the door. Do you want to hug a handshake or a high five? <laughs> it's just the support is amazing. And when your child just is having a happy day, wants to come to school, it's just wonderful. And you know, last week she was having a tougher week and all the teachers were there to, you know, to help her and to find out what would make it easier for her. And that felt wonderful. I couldn't thank the teachers enough at the end of the week. Like that meant everything to me, that they were just right there, you know, to just help. So that's why I like the school. You know, sometimes you just get to step back and you get to see your whole classroom and you get to see kids that are really actively engaged and you think, oh wow, like we created this. You know, we as a classroom team of staff and children have created this lovely learning environment where kids are really happy to be here. To learn more about what Edmonton Public Schools is doing to support inclusion, visit us online at epsb.ca backslash inclusive learning.